Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The 17th Sunday after Pentecost falls on October 2nd, 2022. And the texts uh, are these. The complimentary first reading is Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Or the semi-continuous or alternate first reading is Lamentations 1, 1 through 6. The psalm is number 37, verses 1 through 9. Epistle fans, it's 2 Timothy 1, 1 through 14. And then Luke 17, verses 5 through 10. It is October already. Wow. Here in Preaching Land, here in Minnesota, oh. it's you know probably going to snow this weekend. Um <laughs> That. Here we are, and we've been oh, doing. We, is an invitation. That's not fair. <laughs> we've been doing a run of parables in Luke, and this still is kind of a parable because Jesus has this imagined scene where, for some reason, his disciples own slaves, and, and uh, but then also kind of flips the switch and says, "No, a slave would respond." It's a, it's. My point is, it's a really weird passage, and it's a difficult passage. Mm -hmm. uh, it raises a lot of questions among interpreters. Yeah, like you needed me to tell you that. So a different kind of text. And so now it's it, it's a bit of a switch, I think, from the, the pattern that we've been in. Yeah, and I think one of the challenges of this passage, and we've we've been working through Luke and the listeners have heard us talk about the ways in which there are consequences for behavior and and the and what are your choices and how will you embody God's law and and follow God's law and so that's the context that we need to remember for the apostles requesting uh, the the apostles request of Jesus increase our faith because so much of what, you know, a line like this gets pulled out of this context and that you need to have more faith. You need to uh, believe in, you know, you need to believe in if you just believed more, if you just had more faith, then this is what would happen or this is what would not happen. Uh, I really worry about a phrase like this. When it when it gets removed from its literary context, when the the context is the the lack of faith has not been having faith. It's been how that faith gets embodied. That faith is not something that you have. It's what you do. And so, to what extent the apostles are asking, you know, the disciples are asking, "Oh, I just need to have more faith." They're at, how how do I how do I um, how do I better embody my faith? You know, uh, uh, how, how, how is it that I can, how is it that I can uh, follow what you're talking about, Jesus? How is it that I can do what, what, what you're asking of us that, uh, that is, that is a true embodiment of what faith is in God and what faith is in Jesus? So that's the first thing that I would want to kind of unpack a little bit for people so that it doesn't turn into them just, you know, oh, I need more faith. And then it ought to, no, they, how is it? They increase the works of faith or increase the doing of faith. How is that possible? That's my first thing. And that, that, that I think the, I appreciate that because I think that's exactly where this text goes in the sense of it, it's not about the reward or the gain. It's about just doing what we're supposed to do. I mean, this whole set of, uh, of you know, those servants that you have, um, they're not, if they do their job, if they do what they're supposed to do, um, it's not... Uh, it's not that you're going to be, oh, wow, that's so wonderful. You did what you were supposed to do. Well, translate that back to how do we live out our faith? You know, it, it's not about us asking for some sign in the world that we're these good religious folks. Eh, wrong answer. It is 
how do I, with whatever measure of faith I have, exercise that so that others uh, that I am supposed to be uh, generously serving uh, experience the presence and peace of God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, yeah, I, I'm, I think this passage this passage is not going to answer a lot of the questions that I think we often bring to it, which is, have the disciples asked a good question or a dumb question? <laughs> um, what's up with the way it talks about enslavement as kind of the, the ability to make somebody do whatever you want them to do without that being kind of held up for any kind of moral scrutiny? Right? You know, I mean, it's just not going to answer some of those questions. But it does muddy a lot of waters, which is a preacher I enjoy, <laughs> being able to kind of lead people into those and to say, okay, how does this make us rethink some of our basic assumptions? Mm -hmm. And especially with the Habakkuk passage, which as far as I can tell is useful this week, only insofar as it raises the question of what does it mean to live by faith? Mm -hmm. um, so what is faith then? It's an mm -hmm. interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, previous to this, we've had a couple of verses that warn about uh, doing damage to, to, to vulnerable, uh, to vulnerable uh, people, um, perhaps even uh, to children, right? This idea of, you know, better to have a millstone hung on your neck and thrown into the sea, you know? So the dangers of exploiting somebody else, uh, the dangers of not being a forgiving person. After this passage, we're gonna hear about Thanksgiving in giving thanks for the gifts that God has given you. So just it, for me, it kind of raises the question of what do we think faith is? Is faith power? Mm -hmm. Is faith the power to move trees into the ocean if you want to? Is faith uh, work? Is it doing the work that's required? Is faith just humility and saying, well, you know, don't worry about me. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it obedience? And if so, how do, we, how do we parse that word obedience for a modern culture to hear? Mm -hmm. um, is faith gratitude? I mean, you know what I mean? Just to, so yeah, if I were preaching this, I would just explore all of those things. And then, cause that raises the question then, which I think both of you have talked about is faith quantifiable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that even the right question to ask or not? Cause I'm not sure if the disciples are, are lunkheads or not for asking the question or for making the statement. I just don't know. It's hard to tell if Jesus is being sarcastic with them. Yeah. Or if he's chiding them, or if he's just saying, if you really understood what faith was all about, you would view the world in such a different lens. I think I think it's the latter, but I'm not certain. Yeah, yeah. I just muddied more waters from the way you both are <laughs> into your cameras right now, but that's those are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. But I I think that's the that's an important point is how is it that we we have a you know increase sounds like a quantifiable, like we just need more faith and then things will be better or we'll be able to follow God's law better or something like that. And that's really, that I don't, from what we've said so far and where Jesus goes, it's, 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 a, there's these demonstrative, there's these demonstrated or demonstrable uh, qualities that are that seem to be recognized. I mean, if you do a, you know, if you do a search of pistis in Luke, for example, you go back to the anointing of G, the anointing of Jesus in Luke, which is in Luke 7, where the woman comes in from the city and washes, you know, washes Jesus' feet. And Jesus says, you know, your your um your faith, your faith has saved you. Well, what is she? You know, what has she done there? Uh, how is it that we can use some of those places and examples that uh, that and particularly, I think, for people. And if we take this into Habakkuk, like, I don't know that I want a whole sermon that problematizes faith, but it would be <laughs> be worth a little problematizing because the way in which we default to certain definitions of what faith is and that we can't easily do that. And uh, and to maybe invite people into a larger conversation or a greater reflection on really what we're getting here is not about it, it that having faith but without doing faith is 
is kind of at stake uh, and how, how we can help people make that connection more. Something along those lines. And I, I think the conversation we're having is, is, is problematizing the way that we, we operationalize faith in the sense of uh, quantifying that I have it so that I can do something, um, so that I can do something so that I can be right, uh, so that I can be the kind of person that is the right religious person. Where in, in actuality, I read this, uh, I, I would challenge us to read this, uh, where the focus again turns back to God. You know, uh, the confidence that I have, even if it's just a little bit, um, and this this takes us into Habakkuk because Habakkuk is frustrated and rightly so, and yet has enough faith to say, how long am I going to keep seeing this? How long am I going to keep saying this? How long are things going to be this way? And and it's, it's not... Uh, uh, a name it, claim it kind of uh, approach. It's, uh, I've got enough to believe that this isn't the way that things are supposed to be. And I'm going to come with just that smidgen and, and, and make critique. And, uh, and, and I think that's what you're getting at, uh, Caroline, or at least that's how I'm hearing it in terms of how do we live it out? Just the smidgen that we have. Um, because that's what becomes a witness to God showing up or, or a pointing where God has shown up um, in the midst of the horror that we live in. Mm -hmm. Lamentations? <laughs> we finished Habakkuk as well already. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, I'm... It's, well, the frustration... Let me say one more thing, right? The frustration in Habakkuk is so palpable and... And and God doesn't do a whole lot to help that in the in the verses that are skipped over, um, but then again, what is how does faith matter for that? It gets to the question of what do you expect faith to do to your life, or to your personality, or to your identity? And that's the maybe that's hmm. part of it too. Hmm. The Bible certainly promises it'll do something, but just to put that up for exploration. Anyway, Carolyn, you were really excited about Lamentations. No, mostly because I don't ever know what to do with Habakkuk. I'm always surprised. It's one of those books that I'm always surprised. Like, I think oh, you, in the past you have said, is that really in the Bible? I know. I say that with Obadiah too. I always make fun of Habakkuk. Like, you know, whose favorite book is Habakkuk? And 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 one time I was, somebody did say it was Habakkuk. So that, no. So I feel bad. I feel bad about Habakkuk. In days like these, sure. I I'm, I need those words. But I'm ready to go to Lamentations, not that they're any better. But you're up. And Second <laughs> Timothy is coming, so I know you're excited. <laughs> Lamentations. This is a brutal passage. Go ahead. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Um, a recognition. And, and again, uh, I, I parallel it with uh, the frustration in the voice of uh, Habakkuk. How long? Why do I have to look at this? And if we answer the faith question, can I trust that the portions that are not read there, can I trust that God's way of handling it, which the prophet says, that is so not the way to handle it. Do I have the faith to trust that God's faithfulness means that what God is doing that is so weird and so out of character is actually going to be okay for all of us? And that's basically what lamentation does, because it's saying we're looking at the abandonment of all that was flourishing and uh, all the promise. And, oh, man, this just seems like such a real word to us in our world today. Um, all the promise, I I'll speak personally, all the promise that my Sunday school teacher said would be, if we live this way, would be the life that we would find, um, you know, in another decade or two. And now I'm living in that decade or two. And rather than seeing all of the flourishing, I'm seeing the abandonment. And what it causes me to do is to still say my Sunday school teachers were right, but I wanted them to be right about the flourishing, not right about the abandonment. Mm -hmm. But as, as we've said uh, in, in previous text, 
Um, these are the consequences of the choices that we've made, the actions that we've taken. And that's why we have to look at it. That, that's why we have to see it. There is mourning. We need to lament. We need to attend to this because everyone is groaning, not just the poor, but the priests. Um, that, you know, young girls are grieving. Oh my, there's a long way to go with that in our present culture, huh? Um, and and I, wanted, I wanted the prosperity and that's not where we are. And it, it means that the word is just as truthful. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure I need the prosperity. I just need the hope. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's and and the the sense of of hopelessness that's in this, and, mm -hmm. and I mean it's a text that some people need to know is in the Bible that the Bible gives voice to this. And I don't want to equate my disappointment with the world with a with an exilic or post exilic kind of <laughs> disappointment um, at all. But just to kind of say, there's passages that can pull us into dialogue with the wisdom of the past with the experience of God in the past and, and bring us around. I mean, this is, remember, this is part of a series where we've been studying the, the prophets and the context into which the prophets speak, but also the, the character, the person of a prophet, mm -hmm. what kind of person steps into these moments and speaks or laments or resolves. So this is one more way to do that is to say, what resource do we have in our traditions to help us think about the lament, but also the fight. And then to help people realize that different people are called into different roles at different times to respond. Mm -hmm. And Lamentations gives us one person's or one, one voice's understanding of what they can contribute at, the, at a current moment of, of, of despair. I think one thing that I, uh, I would lift up to about this passage is, is you know, Lamentations is, are these laments about uh, about the fall of Jerusalem, but uh, but the way in which that lament is put onto an individual, and I think there's something quite meaningful, or even um, yeah, in in that the way in which that the lament is personified, or the lament is embodied by this one person, and I think that's another aspect of where we are that yes there's communal lament of what of what the kinds of grief that we are experiencing coming out of not really sort of maybe a pandemic uh but all the other uh, all the other realities of our of our world and it's hard i think it's hard also to in the midst of that to name your own lament your own personal lament and your own grief uh, because how does it really compare to, <laughs> to, but, but there's something beautiful that, that, that's held together here mm -hmm. that it's, yes, it's a, it's a communal corporate lament for a people, but at the same, and for a community, but at the same time, it invites you to articulate your own, your, the own specificities of your lament. And that's what I hear with the widow. And I think maybe to have people, um, to invite people to that kind of particularity and that that's okay as well. Mm -hmm. That God hears both, that God hears the corporate lament and grief, but God hears your individual grief and lament and that this passage gives, gives uh, language and permission for both. I love how both of you are naming um, that this gives voice to those individual and community rea communal realities. Um, and um, uh, whether it's, it's wandering in the wilderness, um, uh, you know, after the exodus, or if it's um, uh, dealing with the devastation of exile, or it's living in the 21st century present moment of the post pandemics, um, not just the virus, uh, but the political division and the, um, uh, the, the broken homes and, and the broken communities and, and, and all of that. That's our moment. Uh, and uh, there's uh, almost a, a parallel that comes with the psalm here 
which uh, challenges us um, not, not to worry that we don't have because someone we think shouldn't have has the evildoer, the wrongdoer, the, the one that we have judged seems to be succeeding right now. And we don't have to be envious of that because here's another word you can depend on is that that frivolous confidence that they have. Um, is this a tag along for the weeks that we've talked about the choice of wealth versus the choice of God? Um, um, that's going to fade away. But if you take delight in God, if you take delight in the world, word, uh, uh, in the Lord, if you, if you put your trust in him, then your behavior will be different. It won't be envious. And this is a hard text. It, 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 it won't be uh, wanting to get revenge. It won't be anger. Um, it, it, it keeps us from that wrath because that makes us the evildoer. Wow. That's not, that, this psalm, which starts off saying, okay, actually becomes as much a prophetic word as, as uh, Habakkuk and, and, and Amos has. And um, I, I'm just going to say this because I know we're going to go there. I think it's a fitting lead into uh, for Second Timothy. Uh -huh. <laughs> the psalm is your uh, is your Sunday school teacher. Yes. Oh, yes. Just exactly. saying. Just wait. It's going to work out. Yeah. Gonna, do not fret. Do not fret. That's yeah. yeah. Kelly Thanks Murphy's for commentary really helped me get a sense of how it's working its way through there as well. Yeah. True. So, all right, this is the first of four weeks on Second Timothy. Yes. Which is, um, which is, of course, lumped with First Timothy and Titus, but in many ways is, is different. I think even in terms of a genre, it's, mm -hmm. this is a book that's, that's styled much more as a kind of testimonial literature uh, a testament literature in in that it's it's an author basically facing his death talking to one of his successors and trying to kind of hand things over so for people to be aware of that just contextually the way the letter is constructed you know the voice of paul at, at the end uh, and so that that idea of handing over or handing things on is such an important part i think of understanding this letter. So be aware of that going in. Be aware too, this is a really popular book in some, in some currents of American Christianity as well. So um, some of us make fun of the pastoral epistles quite a bit, but they're really, really popular in some settings. So be aware that if we're not offering a compelling interpretation of them, people will find, They'll find others. somewhere else that you might not like as much. So which is why I mentioned that at the beginning, but the lectionary does include second Timothy three sixteen, So yes. you will get to, uh, you will get to talk about that, but you will. And, but there's great stuff here about, you know, don't, don't, don't be mean to Lois oh. and Eunice. No, 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 no. I actually second <laughs> Timothy. I, I, <clears throat> I like, uh, uh, well, I like a little bit better for, well, for two reasons. I don't really like and that. I think I, what? I don't really like either one of them, but go ahead. Oh. You're doing great. <laughs> Well, I, I love the line, I, you know, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now uh, sure lives in you. And then the line, uh, I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I am put my trust, and I am sure that he's able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him, or what has been entrusted to me. It's a, a challenging translation. But uh, particularly thinking a lot about that as I've been attending uh, my dad's health and the way in which I have reflected on how the kind of faith that he passed down to me and the kind of faith that that uh, he embodied that now I feel like I'm living more into every single day. Uh, and he, this is a side thing, but he received an award back in June for his uh, for his work with the Southern California Synod at the time 
with AIDS Project Los Angeles and his, his chaplaincy with the Spiritual Advisory Committee and how that, that when nobody else would be, was there for persons suffering with AIDS and dying with AIDS, that he stepped into that place of, of being, of doing faith. And, and, and so uh, I think this passage is beautiful for, uh, at least it, when I read it uh, for, in preparation for our podcasting, I just, I could not, not think of my dad and the way in which that uh, I am, yeah, living more into the faith that he lived every single day. And what difference does that make for what faith means to me and how I define it? And, 